all good. And the Lord this week has brought me back to something that I was ready to just go with and just spoke so much more in my heart. And I got to thinking, Lord, let it snow every other week. Because God, God just really spoke something to me. I'm kidding on the snow, but kind of. Over and over, we've been in this series in the book of Acts, by the way. Uh, we've made our way. You can be turning to Acts chapter 9. But over and over in the New Testament especially, and I'm telling you, if you have ever heard anything that I have spoken from this pulpit, I pray that you hear me this morning. Thank you, Jesus. We see people come to Jesus, and Jesus respond to them. You see this action of someone leaving the place that they are and intentionally going and trying to find Jesus, and Jesus responds to them. Had the woman with the issue of blood who had struggled with this issue, and then she decided, if I could only touch the hem of his garment, I would be made whole. So she left the place of despair where she was, she goes to Jesus. It was her intentions. It was her movement that made her way to Jesus. And as her faith was, so was she. She was whole. We see the centurion who had a servant who was sick. He said, I I've heard a lot about Jesus. I've got to make my way to him. So he goes to Jesus, and Jesus speaks the word, and his servant was healed at that hour. We see Zacchaeus, a small little person that climbs a sycamore tree. Because he had to get to where Jesus was. Over and over, people leaving the place that they are and going to Jesus. The problem is, and that's a good thing, that's not a problem, that's a good thing. But those type of instances have led us to believe some things that simply is not grace. And this morning, I'm going to talk on the issue of grace. I tell you, it's a dangerous message. It's a message that got Jesus killed. It's a message that got his disciples murdered over and over again and persecuted over the issue of grace. But it's formed things in our heart that we have started believing things such as this. And I, I dare you to find this verse in the Bible. God helps those who help themselves. But boy, we quote that. God helps those that help themselves. This person sitting here, well, they deserve to be there. God helps those that help themselves. They're not going to help themselves. Even God can't help them now, okay? You take one step towards God, he'll take two steps towards you. That's Romans chapter 23. It's not in there, although I believe in the principle of going Jesus. Last week, we see the Ethiopian, or last week before, the Ethiopian eunuch desperately searching to find truth. He goes to the temple to worship. He's out in the desert place reading the book of Isaiah, trying to find his way to truth. And what if people aren't coming to him? What type of mindset do we have as believers? Well, we think things like this. Well, they made their bed. They can sleep in it. They're living in sin and rebellion, and they deserve what's coming to them. You might not have ever vocalized those words, but let me tell you, you've thought them. And the truth is, when we find ourselves in that place, well, they've made their bed, they can sleep in it. Until they do something to help themselves, God can't help them. Let me tell you what's at stake. We have deviated from the line of grace. And we've deviated from the hard line that is the gospel message. Acts chapter 9, and I'm going to prove it. But Saul, still breathing threats, thank you, Jesus, for your word. Man, I love the Lord. He's done so much. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogue of Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. 
Let's just stop right there. And I want to go into a little backstory of the life of Paul. We know that Paul was a Pharisee. We know that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, trained under Gamaliel himself at his feet. I want you to imagine this young boy growing up in Jewish tradition, Jewish culture, and then he became enthralled with the Pharisaical ways, relying on his own works, dependent upon his own flesh, without any type of understanding of grace or mercy. It was all the law. It was all works. It was all what we could do to get ourselves back to God. He was so religious. He actually believed that he was a cut above everyone else. While his friends pursued other things and participated in other things, he never did. Time to wake up. He was better with them. He was better than them, and he knew it. He believed that his works had placed him way up here. He thought he was good. And every pharisaical law he would keep, standing in his own righteousness, believing that he was something better. He became trained at the feet of the great teacher Gamaliel. He was elevated quickly through the ranks and became a Pharisee among Pharisees. He looked down his nose at people that couldn't keep the law like he could because he was obviously better. Now, I know you're not finding yourself in this place. Anybody that wasn't as good as he was, he just looked down upon. Him and his Pharisee buddies would dream up new ideas to make new laws that people could never possibly live by, leaving people in a constant state of failure. If there's one word that defined this man's life, it was law. It was works. It was self. Till he hears of a prophet that comes to town. He was heralded by the great prophet, John the Baptist. And his name was Jesus. And he heard stories. And I want you to think about this. Don't get, don't get lost here. I want you to think about this. A Pharisee standing in his own works, standing on his own law, everything that he's done, his own righteousness. And then this prophet comes to town, and he's doing things just absolutely absurd that's unheard of for a religious person to do. He had lunch with sinners and tax collectors. Can't you just imagine somebody standing on their own works, how that makes them feel? He just couldn't stand him, just like every other Pharisee. That's the reason the Pharisees hated Jesus. He totally went against everything that they had built, this culture of them being elevated above everyone else. And Jesus comes, and he starts having lunch with tax collectors and sinners. Matter of fact, that was the name that they called him. That's what they called Jesus by. Your master dines with tax collectors. I've heard it. What a strike against him. It was told that Jesus even spoke to a sinner Samaritan woman at a well and he did it on his own accord he went up and spoke to this woman can you imagine the horror of speaking to a sinner like that a known sinner who had already had five husbands and now she shacked up with somebody and Jesus goes to her Pharisees hated him because of things like that because it totally went against law works everything they could produce in themselves that they were standing on. It went against that. Then it was even told that Jesus allowed a sinner woman to anoint his feet with oil and kissed his feet with her tears as well. Can you imagine what that did in the eyes of a Pharisee? This prophet Jesus stood against everything that Paul did. Paul's world, there was no place for grace because he had worked so hard living according to the law. And the time came, they had to do something about it. This man had spit in their face enough, even calling them names. You brood of vipers, who do you think you are? Well, that just crawled all over Paul and his Pharisee buddies. 
They had to do something about it. So they schemed and they arrested him so they could get rid of this man. We don't know for certain, but a large time hasn't passed before Paul enters up into the story. But just give me a little liberty this morning. I can imagine Paul in the crowd inciting people as judgment is passed against Jesus. I could see him in the council. I can see him there with the Pharisees casting judgment. I could see him in the crowd where Pilate was going to condemn Jesus to execution. I could see Paul going around telling people in their ears, yell crucify. And I can see him, crucify him, crucify him. Come on, everybody, crucify him. Because he hated him. He hated Jesus. All the Pharisees hated him. And Paul was a Pharisee among Pharisees. But we know the rest of the story. Jesus was crucified that we sang about this morning. He was resurrected. When Jesus shows back up on the scene, imagine that dagger in the heart of the Pharisees. They couldn't stand him. I thought we got rid of this guy. And then they hear of an uproar coming out of an upper room in Jerusalem and these disciples getting on fire. And they saw 3,000 devout Jews bow to the feet of Jesus and accept him as their Lord. Imagine what that did to a Pharisee who thought they had ridded themselves. They saw, Paul saw, at the temple one day, going up to temple, he saw two of these people that claimed Jesus did this. Heal a lame man in Acts chapter 3 that we studied about so many weeks ago. And then that man come in the temple. He saw this, and it just crawled all over him. The only person mentioned by name when this disciple of Jesus named Stephen gave his deliberation of Jesus and then was stoned publicly, killed for expressing the name of Jesus. The only name we see other than Stephen is the name of Paul. A Pharisee who hated grace, who hated everything that stood against his way of life, standing on his own works, standing on his own flesh. It just simply says, and Paul, a young man, stood there holding their coats, nodding affirmingly. Imagine the hatred in a person's heart, the pure vitriol that resides in the heart of a man to see someone executed publicly by stoning. And sit there like, this is right. Imagine that hatred. It goes on to say from there, and Paul ravaged the church. Imagine the hatred in a person. See, I told you about people that made a step towards Jesus. Because you take one step towards him, he'll take two steps towards you. This is not Paul's story. Paul is running as fast as he can away from the name of Jesus because he hates it. He goes to the high priest. Imagine the hatred for letters that he can go from town to town to bring people bound. Just imagine how much you'd have to hate somebody. Believe Benton. You come to Richie, the pastor of Christian Fellowship. I'm asking for permission to go to Paducah today. And everybody that says the name of Jesus, I want them either killed or arrested and brought to you. Would you give me permission to do this? I hate these people. And apparently he got the letters. Hatred. Rebellion. Hostility against the name of of Jesus. That's the man we're talking about this morning. That's the person that this whole story is about. Now I want to continue the story. But I wanted to give you a little backstory of who we're talking about. Verse 3. As he went on his way, he approached Damascus. Thinking about the people that he's going to kill. Thinking about the people that he's going to personally arrest. And destroy that name. Destroy that way. And suddenly. Man, I thank God for the suddenlies that's happened in my life. 
when I was running in hostility to the name of Jesus. When I was living a life of rebellion against the name of my Savior. I thank God for the suddenly that happened in my life. I can't even read. And suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, I heard a voice saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you? I don't even know you. Who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus that you're persecuting. Rise and enter the city and you'll be told what to do. The men who were with him, we could use some Marshall County phrases. <laughs> Sounds real spirit. They were terrified. They were sore afraid. They were terrified. Yeah. Hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, we'll get to this part in a minute. He said, here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarshish named Saul. For behold, he is praying and he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias Come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. How would you respond to that? A man that is known out of everybody for hating you for the name that you call on. A man that despises you. A man that wants to kill you. A man that has permission from the high priest to arrest you to persecute you, to ravage you. And God speaks to you, hey, go to this guy. No, God, get behind me, Satan. That is not, you, that is not mindful of the things of God. Greater is he that's in me than he that, that is not the Lord. But Ananias answered, said, Lord, I've heard from many people about this man. How much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go. For he's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered his house. Laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul. Interesting greeting. Well, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes. And he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Two more verses. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. Man. Woman with the issue of blood makes her way towards Jesus. Zacchaeus makes his way towards Jesus. The sinner woman at the well, she makes her way towards Jesus. Jesus responds. But the truth of grace is not that. You get asked questions all the time. Have you found Jesus? Let me tell you something. Jesus never was lost. The truth of the gospel is that God has come running after us. Man. 
Jesus wasn't in need of being found. Jesus left his throne in heaven and intentionally came to us. You may have accepted him and the work that he's done for you, but you didn't find him. He found you. You were the one that was lost. We're reading about Paul, but truthfully, it was you and it was me that was running in our rebellion against the name of Jesus. But the truth of grace is not that we found him. The truth of grace is that he came running after me. And the truth is your goodness will not award you anything. Your works don't earn you anything. Your righteousness doesn't give you anything. And the man that has stood on his works for his whole life and trained in the ways of Phariseeism can now pen words such as this. For my righteousness is as filthy rags. The same man that was writing all across the city trying to find people to kill. He's the one who now says there's nothing good in me. It's not about your goodness. It's not about you at all. I was thinking this week. Probably one of the most famous and oft-quoted chapters in the Bible is from King David in the 23rd Psalm. You know it. We could quote it. I'm not going to because my brain's a little off. I might miss something, and then I'll get an email about it. He can't even quote the 23rd Psalm. Give me a break. But I can tell you the last word of it. Surely... Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. For as the young child says, surely to goodness, mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And boy, is that right. When you are running a life of hostility against the name of Jesus. When you are living in outright rebellion to the name of Jesus. When you're doing your own thing, thinking you're fine, standing on your own works. Or if you could care less and are doing your own thing. That verse is true. Mercy is chasing after you. Mercy is following after you. The gospel is not that you were good enough. That you were cut above the rest and you made it into the club by the skin of your teeth. Never knew what that means. Skin of your teeth, but I'll say it. That's not the gospel. The gospel isn't things that you can sit and list that you've never done. Well, I never did that. I don't care what you did or what you did not do. There. You're awesome. There's your applause. Standing ovation. You're awesome. Your flesh is amazing. There. Now let's get over that. That's not what the gospel is. The heart of the gospel is that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us and gave himself for us. Good gracious. Mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I pray to God, I'll follow him all the days of my life. But when I'm running in rebellion, when I'm doing things I don't need to be doing, mercy's chasing after me. There's a song I've been listening to this week. Old song. Old song. Well, not that old. You remember that Phillips, Craig, and Dean song? Mercy came running. You remember that? 
I'm going to give it a shot. Mercy came running like a prisoner set free. Looked past all my failures to the point of my need. Till the sin that I carried was all I could see. And when I could not reach mercy, mercy came running to me. Man, that's awesome. It's the truth of the gospel. This man had lived his life. If there's anybody that did not deserve it, it was Paul. He simply hated Jesus. Mercy chases us, surely to goodness. Mercy will follow you. First point is that God came running after us. Do what? First point. First point. An hour into the sermon. Point one. Introduction. But it was a good first point. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mercy runs after us. Second point is this. God doesn't give up on those that are living in that condition. Not only is mercy running, because a lot of times we hear things like, well, they've made their decision. They've said no to Jesus. They've made their decision. God doesn't give up on people. Aren't you thankful he never gave up on you? One of the things that just makes me want to vomit inside of the church is when somebody messes up and they're so easily cast aside. They've made their decision. No mercy's chasing after them. Pray that it finds them. God doesn't give up on people. Stop standing aside and casting judgment on people and desiring people to pay for their actions because mercy's calling out to them. Mercy. Third point is this. Receive people as brothers that's had an encounter with Jesus. And in us proclaim, Brother Saul. And he welcomed him into his home and he fed him. Can we get rid of the cliques in church? Can we get rid of the little morality club? Can we just close the doors to the Museum of Saints? And let that museum go bankrupt? And when someone messes up or a sinner comes and mercy's found them, whew, man, let's embrace them. It's not you're not welcome here. That's not what grace is. Grace is chasing after them. And when it finds them, brother Saul, man, there's a phrase that goes around a lot. Well, Richie, that's hyper grace. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ was hyper grace. Maybe not the way you define it, but he was. It didn't matter what anybody had done. Surely, to goodness, mercy will follow you all the days of your life. I don't know why or when in Christendom we've adopted the phrase, well, this isn't said, but it's lived. Grace for us, judgment for everybody else. That's not in a statement of faith of this church. Although we fall into that trap a lot, don't we? Mercy's running. My last point is this. How quickly God can use people in ministry. This man 
was not a Christian. He hated Jesus and everybody that had anything to do with Jesus. He sees a lot. God saves him because mercy caught him. Ananias, although reluctantly, went to him and embraced him as Brother Saul. I don't know why that's fun to say, but it is. It, the sad thing is, that's probably all you'll remember. Brother Saul. Scales fall off his eyes. Verse 20, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. Let me tell you the prerequisite for ministry. Having an encounter with Jesus. Has Jesus done something in your life? Has he? You are so commissioned to tell people about it. <laughs> you don't require 23 years in a seminary to suck every bit of life and joy out of your life in Christ. You don't require to be an apprentice to someone else, although I believe in honor, I believe in leadership, fathering relationships. I'm not taken away from that. Your requirement for ministry is that you've had an encounter with Jesus. And all ministry is, is telling people what Jesus has done in your life. Well, I can't do that. I'm not, I'm not full-time ministry. Well, has Jesus done something in your life? Yeah, sure he has. Then tell somebody about it. Welcome to the ministry. It's fun. Brother Saul. Paul did not require a class or indoctrination to how things go in Ananias' church. See, that's another thing. Okay, we come. I know you've accepted Jesus, but we're going to add a couple things to that before you're in the club. Here's how we do things here. This is what's decent at Christian Fellowship Church. You need to, and I'm not against that, okay? I'm not against for finding protocols, stuff like that. But re, that's not a requirement for your standing in Jesus Christ. You don't require a six weeks worth of indoctrination into how we do things right and better than the church down the road. You're going to learn that here. I'm going to stop because I feel glaring eyes even though I'm not looking at you. Mercy is running after us. Mercy will never stop running after us. Receive people as brothers and sisters once mercy's caught them and release them to tell somebody about it. All right. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. First thing let's do, let's thank Jesus that mercy found us. Lord, like Paul, I empty myself of anything I have to offer in my flesh because it's nothing but filthy rags. It's refuse. It's dung. Lord, I've got nothing. There is nothing good in Richie Clendenin. There's nothing but a heart of rebellion and hostility. But Lord Jesus, I thank you for the power of the cross. Lord, we thank you for the power of grace. We thank you for the truth of mercy. We thank you that it can't be exhausted. Lord, they're new every morning. We thank you that we can't get to the end of it, Lord. We thank you. Lord, that there's nothing that we can't do that can't be covered under that strain of mercy and grace. So this morning, in our hardness of hearts, in our own rebellion, Lord, not looking at Paul any longer. Lord, not looking at his life because I see myself there, Lord. My sin might have been different. I might not have ever killed or persecuted Christians, but I lived a life of hostility towards Jesus nonetheless. This morning, God is dealing with some hearts in this place. 
God is dealing with you. And I'm telling you, mercy is catching you today. God wants to touch your life today. You might not see a light from heaven. You might. I don't know. But it doesn't take away from the authenticity and genuineness of an encounter with Jesus nonetheless. Are you tired of running? Are you tired of living in rebellion? Or maybe you're tired of standing on your own flesh and doing it your way in your own strength and in your own works. It's time for mercy to catch you today. Man, God's here in this place and He is calling out to you. He has caught you. And all it takes this morning is just standing up to your feet and just saying, yes, Jesus, I receive. God's calling to some hearts this morning. I've carried a burden all week. If that's you this morning, you're in that place of rebellion against the things of God. You've been doing it your way. You've made a mess of your life. Or maybe you don't realize how big of a mess your life actually is. God has found you today. God sees you today. He's got His finger on your heart today. And it's time to respond to Him today. If that's you, I want you to stand your feet right now. Don't wait a minute. Stand up. Mercy's found you. It's been chasing after you. Surely to goodness it has. Stand to your feet. He's calling out to you this morning. It's the truth of the gospel. While you are still in your sin. Jesus died for you. People standing all over this building. We're not done yet. There's some more people that need to have that encounter with Jesus this morning. It's time to stand. It's time to quit running. Let him catch you this morning. Let him find you today. Stop running. Because I'm telling you, at the end of your run, he is still there. There's no place you can go that mercy won't chase after you. All because of the blood of Jesus, it's time to stand up. It's time to stop the run, guys. It's time to stop the run. We're still not done. There's still people standing. Nobody going to look at you. And if they do, it doesn't matter. Punch them right in the eye. No, I'm kidding. God's calling out to you this morning. He wants your whole heart. He wants it all right now, and it's time to stop running. The run ends today. It ends right now. It ends right now. It ends right now. We're still not finished. There's still somebody. God's dug it, digging on you right now. It's time to answer. It's time to answer it. Stand up. He's calling to you right now. He's found you. He has found you. He has found you. One more minute. One more minute. Saw a moment. Gather around. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but we're going to pray. We're a family at this church. If there's somebody around you standing, stand your feet. We're going to pray right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, it's time. Lord, all that we are, 
Just pray as I pray right now. All that we are, we release into the hands of Jesus, the one that has found us, the one that's been running after us our whole lives. Lord, we submit into those hands right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we submit it all. Like the old song says, I surrender all. I give it all, Lord. We lay it at your feet, King Jesus. Lord, our life of hostility towards you, Lord, in the own rebellion of our hearts, God, we give it to you this morning, Lord. We give it to you, Jesus, and we accept you, Lord. Lord, we find our allegiance in the cross this morning, God. Lord, we are found in the cross. We are covered by the blood of Jesus this morning, Lord. So we receive it, Lord. We receive it, Jesus. We receive the work that you've done in our hearts, Lord. We receive it, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Amen. We'll see you guys tonight at 6.30. God bless you guys.